The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello, welcome to What Catholics Believe. This is another spot program shining the spotlight on some events of particular interest. As you see, I uh, have a uh, covered arm here from rotator cuff surgery, and uh, so I have my arm in a sling. That's why it looks a little bit different. and. Uh, Hopefully that will not be the case next time we record the program, but for the time being, it has to be so. I thank so many of you for praying for my quick recovery from the surgery. The doctor said there was extensive damage, and so I trust that uh, uh, this will give the opportunity for some good penance coming up in the next few days. Now, the last program that we did like this uh, we kind of focused in on uh, Archbishop Vigano and the uh, attacks against him and uh, the strange response that came from Cardinal Supic of Chicago, Cardinal Ouellette of, uh, of Toronto, Canada. And I wanted to make the point, and did make the point in those programs, that actually what Cardinal Supic and what Cardinal Ouellette were saying, uh, that what they were saying was very important. You see, um, we are puzzled by the reaction of Francis and his cardinals and his bishops. We're puzzled by their reaction to this question of the sexual abuse of the young men and children. It seems to be contrary to all common sense and all common decency that they react the way they do. It seemed contrary to common sense and common decency when this Cardinal Supic in Chicago said that we can't be concerned with the question of whether Francis knew about the uh, sexual attacks of his Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. We can't be concerned about that. We can't go down the rabbit hole there because Francis has more important things to do. He has to be concerned about global climate change, and he's got to be concerned about immigration. Okay? And uh, the world over, people reacted to that very negatively, as though they're saying, well, there's no common sense and no common decency to that response. And uh, the same with uh, Bishop Ouellette's, Cardinal Ouellette's uh, attack on Vigano. Uh, people were saying, well, it, it sounds as though, uh, even though he's blaming, blaming Vigano, uh, for acting for venal motives or impure motives, uh, selfish motives. Nonetheless, Cardinal Ouellette is conceding that Archbishop Vigano was telling the truth. He was conceding some of the, th the points that Vigano made. People were focusing on those two issues, but they were not what these, what these responses were all about. The responses were about precisely this that Francis is really the chosen one. He is the chosen one. He's been selected by the, the leftists in the hierarchy of the Novus Ordo to finish the work of Vatican II. That is what this is really all about. And uh, we must not allow any of these issues, these peripheral issues, sexual abuse of children, sexual abuse of uh, teenagers, we must not allow the sexual abuse of the clergy to uh, in any way threaten Francis' great mission. And so we, uh, in other words, Cardinal uh, Ouellette and, and Cardinal Subit are telling uh, Archbishop Vigano, you know that Francis has to finish the work of Vatican II. This is what he was chosen for. This is what he has set about accomplishing. And you have to stop doing this. You have to stop uh, raising these issues and blaming him for things However guilty he may be, it has nothing to do with the primary work that he's called to do, and that is to finish Vatican II. This is really the issue that is at stake here. Now, 
it's as though people were reacting uh, to what these cardinals and other churchmen were saying, and even Francis himself. Uh, people were reacting and saying, they don't get it. They don't get it. Francis doesn't get it. Sufich doesn't get it. Ouellette doesn't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand how grave the situation is. They do get it. They understand. The problem is not that they don't understand. The problem is we don't understand. We have to get the fact that they get it, they understand, but their answers are telling us something very different from what you and I, normal people, think. We like to think we're normal people. That the sexual abuse of children is a paramount evil and there is nothing that can justify it, nothing that can minimize it. <clears throat> we have to address that first and foremost. <clears throat> they don't believe that. They don't see it that way. Why? Because the ultimate mission of Francis is to complete the work of Vatican II, period. And nothing else, including the sexual abuse of children, get in the way. Now, what I mentioned last time was that they see the sexual abuse crisis basically as a peripheral matter, as though it's kind of collateral damage. I was wrong. I retract that statement. I no longer see it that way. I see that as absolutely not the case. They do care very much about this issue, very much about the issue. But they care about it, again, in such a way that you and I would be horrified. They care about it because it is essential to their plan. The sexual abuse crisis in the church today is really an essential part of their plan. Remember, this has been forming now since Vatican II itself. McCarrick uh, and the rest of them, uh, Whirl and the rest of them, they were all being ordained priests just before Vatican II, during Vatican II, in the years after Vatican II, and all of this crisis has been building all of this time since Vatican II. The Boston Globe reported recently that the sexual abuse crisis has been with the church for 20 years. That's absolutely not true. The fact is, that's when it came to light. It had built and built and built over time until it was finally manifested 20 years ago for the first time. But the fact is that careers have been built in the hierarchy of the Novus Ordo Church after Vatican II, there are careers that have been built on this very problem, homosexuality. And these uh, young men who entered as Vatican II, uh, as Vatican II seminarians, and began as Vatican II priests, have brought this to fruition over all these years. But it was actually with the it gendered and gendered at Vatican II. Vatican II gave birth to this. This is what I'm saying over and over again. It is modernism. It is modernism that is the issue. It is the modernism at Vatican II that engendered all of these evil things. It is what has given birth to this monster that we see now. We cannot possibly understand what's happening now except in light of modernism. If we do not understand what's happening now in, in light of modernism, all we can do is thrash and, and, and wave our hands and, uh, and, and cry foul and uh, be upset about it without understanding what really was going on. We even will be fall into the trap of saying, well, this is a homosexual problem. The problem with homosexuality in the church is modernism. Modernism brought it in. This is modernist morality. We have to understand that. That's how the homosexuals got in. This was the door through which they entered. This was where they found a home, like the seven evil spirits who came in and possessed the man in his first condition. His last condition became worse than the first. Modernism is the portal through which all of these evils have entered. We must understand that. If we don't understand that, we cannot understand anything about this. And if we can't understand about it, we can't do anything about it. We have to understand where the problem is. You see, homosexuality was a key for the modernists, a key to accomplish what they intended to do. What they intended to do was destroy the priesthood. Remember, the very first sacrament that the modernists changed in 1968 was the sacrament of holy orders for bishops and priests and deacons. That's the very first sacrament they changed before they changed the mass. <clears throat> 
they changed the sacrament of ordination, of holy orders, for deacons, priests, and bishops. And they attacked holy orders. They attacked the major orders by doing away with the subdiaconate. <clears throat> they attacked the minor orders by doing away with uh, the uh, porterate and by the exorcist. They actually did away with exorcists, the order of exorcists in the church, <clears throat> back in the years after Vatican II. This was their primary target, actually. We shouldn't be at all surprised that Francis himself would see the priesthood as his ultimate target. He realizes that the priesthood is the key to the traditional Catholic Church, and that to dismantle the traditional Catholic Church, to dismantle the traditional Catholic religion, to dismantle the traditional Catholic faith, one has to destroy the priesthood. Because in the priesthood you find the powers of Christ, the power of teaching and governing and sanctifying, especially the power of sanctifying through the sacraments. Francis doesn't want a church that does this. He wants a church that discerns and accompanies. He doesn't really want a church that sanctifies. So when he starts out his pontificate as the, Novus, the Pope of the Novus Ordo, what does Francis say? That we must stop obsessing about abortion, about contraception, about homosexual marriage. We have to stop obsessing about these things. What does he mean there at the very outset of his pontificate? What is he telling us? He's telling us that these moral issues about sexual uh, right or wrong are not the focus, are not going to be the focus, and must not be the focus of either himself or us during his pontificate. He is not going to focus on these things, quite the contrary. He let us know right from the start his, his focus was going to be on social justice, okay? Translated into the word economy, world economy. That's what he's concerned about. We saw that in John the 23rd, we saw it in the, in the encyclicals of John the 23rd, we saw that in encyclicals that have followed that, Povolorum Progressio, the progress of peoples, it is about life in this world, that's the modernist focus. That is Francis's focus entirely. Remember when we had the president some years ago, who during a campaign kept repeating over and over again the same thing, like a mantra. It's the economy, stupid, he kept saying. It's the economy, stupid. He kept saying that in a demeaning way to those who thought there were more important questions than the economy. For Francis, there are no more important questions than world economy. Poverty is everything. It's all that matters. <clears throat> and e inequality, inequality in wealth. This must be rectified. This is the real evil that Francis sees in the world. This is like the only original sin that Francis recognizes is greed, <clears throat> avarice, lust for power, especially in terms of economics. So this falls exactly under the, under the realm of Marxist philosophy. Karl Marx was the one who said that man is an economic animal. Now, you know, as Catholics, <clears throat> we define man as a creature composed of body and soul created in the image and likeness of God, his creator. So we define man as a creature of God. He has a creator to whom he is entirely dependent, upon whom he is entirely dependent, and to whom he is entirely responsible. <clears throat> He's a creature composed of body and soul, and he's created in the very image and likeness, image by, by nature and likeness by grace of the God who made him. That's the Catholic definition of man. The Marxist definition, the Marxist definition denies any spirit in man. Man is merely an economic animal, pure and simple. He thinks about his state of life. He thinks about his quality of life. All he cares about is the food on the plate in front of him, like a dog or a cat, like any other animal. That's the only thing that is of significance to him. He actually, in Karl Marx's view, is reduced to a state lower than that of a mere animal. Um, e even animals can think in terms of, of uh, some basic thoughts of loyalty and fidelity and so on. Um, but Marx takes that away from man entirely. He says everything about human life, the individual human life, and everything about human history is about the economy. It's all about the state of life 
It's all about the quality of life. It's all about the goods of life. It's all about this world. He's a materialist, and that's all there is to us. We are nothing but highly organized chemicals, and all we can think about is other chemicals, material, the things of this world. There is no soul. There is no God, no spirit, no afterlife. There's nothing but the things of this world. That's Marx's idea. Fo Francis's focus is entirely the same. He could easily define man in the same terms. As far as Francis is concerned, man is really an economic animal. This is Francis's focus. In saying that we're not going to obsess about abortion, <laughs> we're not going to obsess about contraception, we're not going to obsess <coughs> about homosexual marriage, he's saying that really these, these matters are not of importance to him. But you know, oddly enough, oddly enough, even while he's saying that these matters are subordinate to the whole matter of the economy and uh, the quality of life that we have, uh, the inequalities uh, of economics that we have in the world today, even though Francis says these things are subordinate to those economic concerns, nonetheless, his pontificate as Pope of the Novus Ordo has obsessed, actually has obsessed about these things. He is obsessed about these things, not only about abortion, obsessively ignored this, actually, spoke it out only when he absolutely had to, to save face. But he has obsessively focused on, of all things, the homosexual aspect of this. He lists three things he's not to going to obsess about. Wouldn't you know? The third thing, the homosexual side of it, he's all about that. This is what he has obsessed about, continually obsessed about these things. In his Amoris Laetitia, what's he talking about? He's talking about communion for those who are living in adulterous relationships, openly living in adultery. He's obsessing about that. We've got to get that through. He insists that we have to make that happen. Okay. And, and as far as the homosexuality goes, why are people reacting to his reaction as though there's something wrong with him? Something doesn't compute. Why isn't he reacting to this whole problem, this whole crisis, the way we think he should, if he really saw it as a crisis? And the answer is because he doesn't see it as a crisis. He sees it as a means to an end. Francis, from the outset, has shown his contempt for the priesthood. He has shown his contempt for the priesthood even in the way he deals with his own priests in Rome. For example, when, he, when the young priest at a meeting with Francis said, young people today don't have any sense of making a lifelong commitment, so it's very difficult for us to prepare them for marriage, for matrimony. And Francis says, yes, it's true. It's hard to explain to young people the idea of a lifelong commitment. And the young priest asks him, well, what do we do? And the Holy Father says, I don't know. And then he goes on to tell a story. Then Francis goes on to tell a story about his own Argentina, where uh, you have common law marriages, where you have Catholic people just uh, living, living together, no marriage, just living together, uh, starting families, having children together. And Francis tells his own priests, those have more uh, the character of true marriages than most of our own marriages, the marriages that you priests do. That most, even the vast majority of the marriages that you priests do are invalid. But the, the basically common law marriages of our Catholic people just getting together, living together, breeding together, having children together, these have more of the character of a true marriage than what you are doing. What contempt is this man showing for his own priests? What is he showing for the sacrament of matrimony? Nothing but contempt. And Francis has shown this from the day he was a child serving Mass himself. I mean, he explained this in Answering a Child, in his little book of Answering Children's Questions. He talked to a child about serving the, the old Mass and deliberately mixing up the Latin to try to trip up the priest. This is worse than tripping up the priest as though he, when he was walking around the altar, sticking your foot out and trying to trip him up there. He is trying to trip him up in his prayers. He's trying to trip him up in the prayers of the Mass, the Latin Mass. And he said his friend and he would, would vie uh, to do who, who could do that the best. They thought it was hysterical to trip up the priest in saying the Latin prayers of the Mass. This is the contempt this man has for the priesthood, for the Mass, for the sacraments, for our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. And this is the contempt that this man has shown all along. Uh, right, do, right down the line, he has shown nothing but contempt for holy orders, 
for holy orders, the idea of the priesthood. Over and over again, he's condemned. The priest, the priest, the priest. The priests are, uh, are uh, too haughty. The priests, are, they, they, sh they should not look upon themselves as being anything or anyone special. They should be at the service of all, low, the least of all, and they should not regard their priesthood as actually setting them apart. from anything. Well, the whole point of being a cleric, co coming from the Latin word clarus means portion or lot. The Lord is my portion and my lot. I have chosen him, or he has chosen me, as we read on this feast of Saints uh, Thaddeus and Jude, that the Lord God chooses his priests. He chooses those to follow him as he chose his apostles. I have not chosen, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you, our Lord says. And so the fact that the men are taken and that they are ordained and that they are chosen and put apart, for to, that, that is their lot in life. To be wholly dedicated to our Lord, wholly de dedicated to the service of the salvation of souls. This is the problem with Francis. To be dedicated for the salvation of souls, the sanctification of souls, the justification from sin, which requires repentance. Francis doesn't want any of that. So the idea of the true priesthood established by Jesus Christ, Francis doesn't want any of that. He wants to leave that behind. He wants to dismantle that and build something else in his place. What does he want to build in his place? He wants to build Francis. He wants to build Francis Church, or what we call Franken Church. He wants to build that on the ruins of the traditional church. In that too, he's like a good Marxist. A Marxist progress recalled for the destruction of the status quo, and the destruction of the status quo, and on its ruins, you must build the new. And then you must destroy that and build the new. And this is the modernist idea, the Marxist idea, of how progress is made. Destroy the old, and on its ruins, build the new. Francis is right now tearing down the last vestiges of the traditional faith, the traditional religion, the traditional church, in the process of building his new church in his own image and likeness. You notice uh, some of the uh, modern sites here, the so-called Catholic sites, have actually begun to refer Fran to Francis as the successor of Jesus Christ. Not the successor of Peter, not the vicar of Christ, but the successor of Jesus Christ. What could be more perfect an expression of modernism than that? The idea that with each passing generation, there is someone who succeeds Jesus in his role in the church, who leads the faithful in experiencing uh, God or the divine at this moment in, in human history, and who actually can unfold for them the new mysteries. I mean, this is, this is modernism. They take the place of the prophet um, and uh, like the, the imams they've got and so on. Um, they, they are speaking for the prophet here. The, the idea that Jesus was a prophet who died and we have his faith experience, we're trying to relive his faith experience, and Francis is going to be the interpreter of modern man as to what that faith experience is is to be now here well then he's the successor of jesus to convey to the rest of the world a faith experience and we all look to francis as the interpreter of the faith experience and how is this going to be god is this going to be related to us through his new synodal church in which he's going to get factions of the church together various representative populations of the church uh, like little Soviets uh, uh, were ga gathered in the Soviet Union, uh, like the, the plumbers and the stock workers and so on, little Soviets, and they were all going to report on the, on the way up what they had found, what they discussed, and it was going to go up to the, the great Communist Party who was going to interpret, the Communist Party was going to interpret the work of all the Soviets of the Soviet Union to the people of Soviet Russia and her satellites as to what the mind was then. Uh, the mind was then of the good Marxist, the good communist, the state of the Marxist mind at that moment. 
and the state of development of mankind toward that perfect, glorious communist society. Francis, again, is conducting himself as the quintessential Marxist, the quintessential modernist in what he does here. Um, he sees homosexuality as a way of breaking down and destroying the whole idea of holy orders. <clears throat> so you see, when he reacts the way he does, certainly not with the reaction you'd think, when he reacts the way he does to the crisis, by meeting with his nine chosen uh, cardinals over there, and, uh, and he's seen to be laughing with them as they're talking about the homosexual abuse crisis in the church. And people are wondering, why are they all laughing? Why this expression of mirth on all these faces when they're talking about the homosexual crisis and the sexual abuse of all these children and the ruin of their lives? That's why. You see, they don't see it the way you see it. They don't see it the way I see it. As a tragedy, it's part of the program. We have to understand this. The modernist program calls for this. <clears throat> it calls for the moral destruction of the Catholic Church. The modernists were preceded by the, uh, the Masons. The Masons forecast all of this in the permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita, and the letter of Piccolo Tigre, and so on. Uh, they, they talked about the need to introduce corruption in the church, and they were going to introduce moral corruption through, first of all, womanhood. They were going to corrupt the woman, the Catholic woman, and they were going to corrupt the Catholic priest. I'm talking about the early 1800s. This is all on record. It's all there for public knowledge. It's all accessible to those who would look for it. The Masons forecast this in Italy, that this is exactly what they were going to do, to morally corrupt the church. Their idea, destroy the Catholic family, you destroy vocations, you destroy the priesthood. Destroy the Catholic family, there will be no more vocations. You destroy the vocations, there will be no more priesthood. This is what we must do to destroy the church. Francis understands this very well. And he's applied himself might and main to accomplish this. Uh, everywhere he turns, he looks to condemn clericalism. What does he mean by that? Exactly, to destroy the idea that there is a clergy, that there are those in the church who are called to exercise a certain function that is not in common with the laity, that they have a special role to play which is established by our, our Lord Jesus Christ himself to which they are called. And they are called not only to be given, uh, let's say, a pedestal, but rather they are given uh, this, this role because they have a great responsibility to Christ. The church always regarded the priest as an altar Christus, another Christ, especially when he stood at the altar. But in everything else he did, administering the sacraments. Another Christ? What has become of that idea under Francis? It's a sham and a fraud. It's a disgrace. People are ashamed. As I go through the airport now and people see the Roman collar, they look at me with disgust because they associate the, the collar which in former days people would just come up to you and talk to you as though they knew you all their life to do everything you stood for. That you were their brother, that you were their father, that you were their son. They, they were associated you in the, in, the, in the common bond of faith and love for our Lord. Now you find disgust in the eyes of the people when they see that. It's very rare now to find a Catholic person who will actually address you as father and actually want to even be associated with you. This is what Francis has done. This is what the modernists have done. This is what the Masons have done. No, no, no. Now Francis and his cardinals, Maradiaga, Marx, the rest of them, they don't see this as a crisis. They see this as a necessary step in the plan to degrade the Catholic priesthood as a step to tear down the traditional church that has to go. I'm going to read some texts for you when I finish this just to back up what I'm saying right now. If you find it hard to imagine, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. It's exactly what we're witnessing happening before our very eyes. Unless you look at it through the eyes of the modernists, you can't understand what's happening. You cannot fathom why they react the way they do. If you see it in the eyes of modernism and what modernists are out to do, everything becomes crystal clear.
They want to destroy holy orders, the, the institution of the priesthood. In the name of clericalism, they say they're going to destroy this because they want to dismantle the traditional church and build on its ruins the, the uh, well, the, the Church of Francis, the Church of Modernism, which is a synodal church. It is a church governed by synods. And the role of the pontiff is to discern, as to interpret the mind of the synods in a statement to, to give you the state of the faith now to which we all must subscribe. You know, Francis just had this youth and its synod over in uh, Italy, and uh, the world was watching this. Conservative Novus Ordo Catholics were watching this with dismay because they feared that he was going to canonize the LGBT agenda at this synod as he canonized the Marxists Romero and uh, Montini at the synod. They thought it would be very, very um, consistent for him to canonize LGBT. Actually, he did in number 150 of the statement <coughs> that was published from the, uh, from the synod. <coughs> yes, he actually did effectively canonize it. But just like at Vatican II, where you have these little time bombs that are set in the council documents and in the footnotes, so this canonization of the LGBT agenda had to be set as a kind of time bomb in the uh, synodal document because, again, the world was watching and ready and ready to, uh, to state in the, in the light of the homosexual abuse crisis, you dare to do that before our very eyes? You dared to do that before the whole world and canonize this while you have homosexual priests um, uh, attacking and, uh, and violating your young people? Yes, even Francis has to know, even Francis, as brash as he is, has to know when he's going to overstep his bounds and maybe overplay his hand. He has to be, still be very careful. And you can be sure that even his gang of nine there are, are advising him when to slow down because this train is going to jump the tracks. They monitor, they see what people, how people are reacting and they know what people are thinking, and they know that the people are not, do not understand what they're actually doing. They don't want people to catch on. They don't want people to find out what they're doing. So they still have to be somewhat careful. Because if people understood what they were really doing, it would be game over for them. They can't afford to let that happen. Uh, they are trying to contain Vigano, they also have to contain Francis at the same time to prevent him from going too far too fast. With regard to this youth synod, though, it's very important for us to realize uh, what a curse is in the Old Testament, how God punishes the people of the Old Testament. One of the greatest punishments he has, he states in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 3, verse 4. Listen to what he says. Listen to how God will punish the people of Israel for their sins, for their idolatry, for their immorality. I quote, For behold, the sovereign Lord of hosts shall take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the valiant and the strong, the whole strength of bread and the whole strength of water. In other words, famine, okay? The strong of Israel will waste away. The strong man, and the man of war, the judge, and the prophet, and the cunning man, and the ancient one, the captain over fifty, and the honorable in countenance, and the counselor, and the architect, and the skillful in eloquent speech, they're all going to fail. Look what comes next. And I will give children to be their princes, and the effeminate shall rule over them. Now, if this doesn't describe this youth synod, I don't know what does. What could more perfectly describe this youth synod than these words, I will give children to be their princes, and the effeminate shall rule over them. 
We saw these bishops, these archbishops, these cardinals fawning over the young people. Everything they said was so wise that it was nothing but modern pablum. It was nothing but nonsense. It was degrading. If I really could see them as Catholic bishops, archbishops, and cardinals, I would be horrified, but they're modernists. To a man, they're modernists. And so they fawn over the, 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 the futile ravings of the modern world. I will give children to be their princes, and the effeminate shall rule over them. Perfect description of this youth of synod with its LGBT agenda and, agenda and all the rest. And uh, the sacred text of uh, the prophet Isaiah continues, And the people shall rush one upon another, and every man against his neighbor. The child shall make it tumult against the elder, and the base against the honorable. Well, if this isn't exactly what's going on right now in Francis's modern church, I don't know what, I, what better way to describe it. But this was stated by God as a curse against his people for their immorality and their infidelity. Well, there you have it. I want to point out some things here. Um, first of all, with regard to the idea of destroying the priesthood, I don't know that anybody has said it better than a certain Bishop Nguyen. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing his name correctly. He evidently, he has a Vietnamese origin. Vincent Long Ben Nguyen, I'm sorry, N G U. Y-E-N, okay? A Franciscan, Bishop of Parramatta Diocese of Sydney, Australia. He gave an address to the New Zealand National Assembly of Diocesan Clergy about the current crisis rocking the church. This is Dateline, now Christ Church, New Zealand, October 23rd, 2018. And uh, this is in an article by Dorothy Cummings, and again, it comes to us through LifeSite News, in an article entitled, Francis Appointed Bishop Touts Women's Ordination, Transformation of Priesthood is Underway. This is what this bishop has to say. And you know what? He is really expressing perfectly Francis' agenda, and this is what we have to expect not only today, but this is what is coming in the future here. This Bishop Long, they call him, Bishop Long says, as important as it is to raise the question of women in the ministry, it is far more important and far worse to persist with structures that fail to convey the message of the gospel to the deep yearnings of the men and women of today. Perfect modernism. It can be taken word for word right out of Pope Pius X's Pascendi. The yearnings, remember, it's all about needs. It's all about the needs of the people. The yearnings of the men and women of the modern day. That's where you'll find the faith, in the yearnings of modern women of today. Okay, that's where we've got to go. It is worse to persist with structures that are out of touch with that, he says. This man is the quintessential modernist. It is in his DNA. Adding women into the mix in terms of admitting them to ordination might be likened to pouring new wine into old wineskins. For the church to flourish, it is more crucial that we come to terms with the flaws of clericalism. Again, in lockstep, in lock mouth, and locked jaw with, with Francis, the flaws of clericalism within the very structure of the church and move beyond its patriarchal matrix. So wants to leave behind the patriarchal makes it, ma ma matrix. He's talking about the priesthood. He's talking about the idea of priests being father. He says we've got to leave that behind. The bishop praised Francis for unleashing a new energy and pouring a new wine upon the church. Pope Francis, he says, has unleashed a new energy. He has poured a new wine which cannot be contained in old wineskins. He said, 
He added later in his talk that such new wine is leading to a, quote, transformation of the priesthood. There is a better wine that the good Lord has prepared for us, he says. The new wine of God's unconditional love, boundless mercy, radical inclusivity, and equality needs to be poured into new wineskins. In other words, the church itself must change. The church is the old wineskin. We have the new religion, the new faith of the new wine. But you can't pour that new wine, a new religion, a new faith into the old church. You have to, you have to get rid of the old wineskin. We need the new wineskin of humility, mutuality, compassion, and powerlessness. The old wineskins of triumphalism, authoritarianism, and supremacy, abetted by clerical power, superiority, and rigidity, he says. My goodness, this man is channeling Francis. He says that uh, Pope John Paul II, he said, reaffirmed in his encyclical Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, the doctrine that a woman can never become a priest, a teaching that Pope Francis' own choice for prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith recently said was infallible. So this bishop is saying there's an infallible statement, or what is called infallible, that women can never be priests. He's dismissing that. He's just simply dismissing that. He's rejecting that whole idea. Despite 2,000 years of influential Catholic female saints, he says, queens and abbesses, the papal encyclical on the dignity of women, the perennial veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the prayerful participation of generations of women, this Bishop Belong believes that women have been excluded from the Church, made invisible in her language, her liturgy, her theology, and even her canon law. And he says, so long as we continue to exclude women, from the church's governance, structures, decision-making processes, and institutional functions. We deprive ourselves of the richness of our full humanity, he said, so long as we continue to make women invisible and inferior to our church's language, liturgy, theology, and canon law. We impoverish ourselves as if we saw or we heard only with one ear and we saw with only one eye, and we think or we thought with only one half of the brain. And very often, it has been proved, it's been the lowest reptilian section thereof. This is kind of curious. This Bishop Long says, we're thinking with the reptilian part of the brain, if we're thinking in terms of patriarchalism, and, and we're thinking in terms of clericalism. He associates that with thinking the way men think, he says. That's like the reptilian part of the brain. Curious that he brings this up because this is very much into the part of the occult. If those, those who know what I'm talking about understand very clearly, those who don't, it's too much to explain right now. But here's what he says. Um, because, as you know, the reptilian section of the brain, the lowest part of the brain that's responsible, for your instinctual behavior, your survival mode, your desire for control, and you know, you just wonder if this whole culture of rigidity, legalism, triumphalism, has been buttressed by this thinking of the reptilian brain. Where did they find this man? Well, I'm afraid there are many others where he came from. The point that I'm getting to in his talk, though, is this, he says in this same speech, Long says, that when the church is called the spotless bride of Christ, this is a blatantly poor image for the Roman Catholic Church. He says you can no longer refer to the church in this way. He says, how can you refer to the church in this way in light of the sexual abuse crisis? How can we ever again think of the Church as our Holy Mother, the Church, as the spotless Bride of Christ? He says, this is all destroyed now. 
And now you begin to understand the thinking of Francis and his co-conspirators to destroy that whole concept of the church as the spotless bride of Christ, the immaculate spouse of Christ. 